In this video, we will discuss subsequences from section 2.2. Let a n be a sequence of real numbers, and let n1, n2, n3, and so on be an increasing sequence of natural numbers. The function f from the natural numbers to the real numbers given by f of j equals a sub n sub j is called a subsequence of the given sequence a sub n. We use the notation a sub n sub j starting at j equals 1, or simply a sub n sub j to denote the subsequence. The index j refers to position in the subsequence. The index n sub j refers to position in the original sequence. The fact that the n sub j sequence is increasing means that we haven't changed the order that the terms appear in the subsequence. We have simply removed terms from the original sequence. To illustrate this concept, consider a general sequence, a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on. One subsequence here is, this, is the subsequence a2, a5, a6, a8, and so on. To see how the notation works, this subsequence is given by the choices j equals 1, n sub 1 equals 2. Notice that a2 is in the first position of the subsequence, and the second position of the original sequence. Next, we have j equals 2 and n sub 2 equals 5. Thus, a5 is in the second position of the subsequence and the fifth position of the original sequence. Next, we have j equals 3 and n sub 3 equals 6, since a6 is in the third position of the subsequence and the sixth position of the original sequence. Finally, j equals 4 and n sub 4 equals 8 means that a8 is in the fourth position of the subsequence and the eighth position of the original. As with sequences, we will often desire a formulaic means of representing the subsequence. Here we look for a function which defines n sub j in terms of j. In other words, we will want to understand how position in the subsequence relates to position in the original sequence. Next, consider the specific sequence 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. One possible subsequence consists of all the terms in the even positions. So for the first term in our subsequence, we want to take the second term in the original, and so we set n sub 1 equal to 2. Thus we have 1 half is the first term in our subsequence since it is the second term in the original sequence. For the second term in our subsequence we want the fourth term in the original and thus we set n2 equal to 4. Then we have 1 fourth as the second term in our subsequence since it is the fourth term in the original. Continuing, for the third term in the subsequence, we want the third even position from the original, or the sixth term in the original sequence, and we set n sub 3 equal to 6. It follows that 1 sixth is the third term in our subsequence. For the fourth term in the subsequence, we choose the eighth term in the original, and we set n sub 4 equal to 8. It follows that 1 eighth is the fourth term in our subsequence. Thus we see that the relationship nj equals 2 times j defines the subsequence 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 sixth, 1 eighth, and so on. Next consider the sequence 1, 1 third, 1 fifth, 1 seventh, and so on. One subsequence here consists of every third term. For the first term in our subsequence, we want the third term from the original and we set n1 equal to 3. For the second term in our subsequence, we want the sixth term from the original, and we set n2 equal to 6. For the third term in our subsequence, we want the ninth term from the original, and we set n3 equal to 9. And finally, for the fourth term in our subsequence, we want the twelfth term from the original, and we set n4 equal to 12. Thus, the relation n sub j equals 3 times j relates position in the subsequence 1 fifth, 1 eleventh, 1 seventeenth, 1 twenty-third, and the original sequence. Notice that the general term in the subsequence can be identified by either observing the pattern in the first four terms 1 fifth, 1 eleventh, 1 seventeenth, 1 twenty-third, or by substituting n equals 3j into the general term of the original sequence. In class, we will prove proposition 2.2.11, but let's take a look at it briefly along with one application. Let a sub n be a sequence converging to a real number a. 
then every subsequence of a sub n also converges to a. This statement should make intuitive sense. If the terms of the sequence a n eventually get close to a and stay close to a, then the same behavior should carry over to subsequences since we haven't changed the order in which the terms appear. More concretely, we can use the definition of convergence. Given that the original sequence a sub n converges to a, we know that given a positive real number epsilon, there is a natural number capital N such that the distance between a sub n and a is less than epsilon whenever little n is greater than or equal to capital N. If we take an arbitrary subsequence a sub n sub j, we need to show that this subsequence also converges to a. To do this, for any epsilon positive, we need to find a natural number capital J so that the distance between a sub n sub j and a is less than epsilon whenever little j is greater than or equal to capital J. To choose capital J, we need to go out far enough in the subsequence so that the terms are past the capital nth position in the original sequence. To illustrate this, suppose we have a sequence and have already specified capital N. For any subsequence, there must be terms in the subsequence which are past the capital nth position in the original, depicted in the second line by a sub n sub capital J and a sub n sub capital J plus 1. The reason for this is that we always choose the sequence of n sub j's that define the subsequence to be an increasing sequence of natural numbers and is therefore unbounded, meaning that we can always exceed any fixed positive value. Thus, if capital N is chosen first, we can find a capital J such that n sub capital J is greater than or equal to capital N and n sub little j is greater than or equal to n sub capital J, which is greater than or equal to capital N, for any j greater than or equal to capital J. Thus, each term in the subsequence past the capital jth position corresponds to a term in the original sequence, which is past the capital nth position. We will write out a formal proof in class. Do we even need to say that? All right, new slide. As a final definition in this section, we have the notion of a subsequential limit. Let a sub n be a sequence and let a be a real number. We call little a a subsequential limit of the sequence a n if there is a subsequence a sub n sub j which converges to a. The following corollary is the contrapositive of proposition 2.2.11 and provides our fourth divergence criterion. If a sequence a sub n has two distinct subsequential limits, then the sequence diverges. As an example, consider the sequence 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, and so on. 1 is a subsequential limit since the subsequence consisting of terms in the odd positions converges to 1. Similarly, 2 is a subsequential limit since the subsequence consisting of terms in the even positions converges to 2. Thus, by the corollary, we conclude that the sequence diverges. Ta-da! The index Gisette. Gisette? <laughs> what was that? Gisette? The index Gisette. I don't know. Okay, well, we're going to try it again from the bullet. It's not a very smart machine. Okay.